Hi, and welcome to the ninth lecture of this deep learning course. Today, we're going to be talking about natural language processing. In previous lectures, we have talked about convolutional neural networks, which are an ideal architecture for image processing. And in the last lecture, we talked about recurrent neural networks and feed forward autoregressive models for sequence processing. And natural language is an ideal application for these type of models. So I thought it would be good to have a look into a closer look into uh, some of these models and to do a lecture dedicated to this particular topic. This lecture is structured into four units. In the first unit, we're going to introduce what a language model is and show some examples. In the second unit, we're going to talk about traditional language models as they have been used in the 70s and 80s and 90s. Then in the third unit, we're going to talk about the more modern reincarnation of these models, which are neural language models that use neural networks. And then in the fourth unit, we're going to talk about a particular about a particularly important um, application of these language models, which is machine translation. So let's get started with language models. A language model models the probability distribution over a sequence of discrete tokens. And these tokens could be words or characters, or whatever where each token can take a value from a vocabulary V. So we have X, T element of V. So here we have a sequence of these tokens, X. We have a sequence length T. And assume these are words. We have the first word, the second word, and so on until the T word. And so we model a probability distribution over, these, over this sequence of discrete tokens where the joint distribution over the sequence, so this is the sequence, the first word, the second word, and so on until the teeth word. The joint distribution over this sequence decomposes into a product of t conditional distributions. p of xt given all of the x with um, index smaller than t. And this is simply a consequence of the product rule, sometimes also called the chain rule of probability. We're not making any approximation here. Right? We can simply rewrite or decompose any joint distribution without doing any approximation in such a form. Or if I write this out, I have p of x1 given p of x2 given x1. And those two multiplied together are, of course, p of x1 given uh, and x2, so the joint distribution, times p of x3 given x1 and x2, times p of x4 given x1 to x3, and so on. Um, this, is, this is just one particular way of decomposing a joint distribution, and we're decomposing it such that each word only depends on, or each token in that sequence only depends on previous tokens in that sequence by iteratively applying the product rule. That's one of these fundamental rules of probability. So depending on the language model, a token can be a word, a character, or a byte, or something else. We have already seen in the lecture on recurrent networks and feedforward models, um, language models that use that operate at the character level. But there's also language models that operate at the word level, which we're going to talk about today. The difficulty of operating at the word level is that the vocabularies are much, much larger. It's easier to operate at the word level because we are, we are, it's easier to model long-term dependencies. At the character level, um, long-term dependencies are hard because if you consider sentences, then in terms of characters, words are far away. So, so that's easy, uh, more easy in uh, when modeling at the word level. But what's hard is that compared to the character level where vocabularies are in the order of like tens or 20 or 30 characters, at the word level, we 
typically have vocabularies of size 10,000, 20,000, 30,000, depending on the language. And so we have very large vocabularies. We need to predict distributions over a, a very large state space. Yeah. And then one thing that's also important is that we um, typically introduce in language models a special token, the end of sentence token, into the vocabulary. So the vocabulary is, let's say, the vocabulary of all words that we want to model plus this end of sentence token, which indicates the end of sentence. So at every, whenever we predict the next word, we can predict one word from the vocabulary, or we can predict the end of sentence to determine that this sentence is finished and the next sentence can start. Let's look at an example. So here's an example for a word language model. An example is um, the probability this is a language model that assigns a probability mass to the sentence the dog ran away end of sentence. And this decomposes based on this product rule into the conditional distributions p of d, p of dog given v, p of ran given v dog, and so on. And we can see that language models in general, but in particular also this word language model, are autoregressive models that predict the next token given all the previous tokens in this sentence and the sequence. So these are autoregressive models. And a good model has a high probability of predicting the likely next word. So let's look at some applications. So one, maybe the most straightforward application of language models is language recognition. Assume we have trained two language models, P and P prime and they assign probabilities to sentences, but they are different models. So they might assign a different probability to the same sentence. P assigns one probability, P prime assigns another probability. And let's assume that P has been trained on English, a large text corpora of English sentences, and P dash has been trained on French sentences. We can then determine which sentence a language is coming from by simply classifying according to such a rule. Language of X is English if the probability if P of X is bigger than P prime of X. The probability for an English sentence is bigger than the probability of a French sentence. Or it can be or it's classified as French otherwise. Let's say a very simple example of the usage of a language model. We can also use a language model to sample new um, sequences. So assume a word language model over sentences, P of X, which has already been trained using the decomposition into conditional probabilities, p of x1 times p of x2 given x1, etc., we can efficiently sample new sentences from this distribution. Right? So we start by sampling, p of, by sampling x1, by sampling the first word, and then we sample the second word conditioned on the first word. And then we sample the third word conditioned on the first two words, and so forth. So it's very easy in linear time we can sample from this model by just sampling a word based on all the previous words. We can also um, use these language models to do Bayesian inference. So let's assume, in this case, this is an example for machine translation. Let's assume we have a language model trained, P of X, and let's consider this as a prior over, over possible sentences, x. And then assume a, a likelihood, or maybe also a proposal mechanism that proposes um, translations y for a sentence x, and that tells us, according to 
this model, how likely that is. This is how machine translation models have worked in the past. So often uh, these are rule-based systems, very complicated systems that propose sentences and assign likelihoods to these sentences, these translations given the input sentence. A sentence X is maybe in English and sentence Y is in French. So when I find a translation, we can find such a, um, a and, and we can define a likelihood model for this that assigns a probability for Y given X. These sentences might not have the same length, which is indicated here by T prime and T. Now, if we have these two, then we can use Bayes' rule to infer the posterior over the translated sentences. So P of X given Y, right, <clears throat> um, is uh, p of y given x times p of x divided by p of y. So we can basically multiply the prior probability of a, a sentence x in, so x is, is the target domain. This is where we want to translate to. So this gives, this tells us how likely that sentence is in a target language. And then we have the likelihood y given x so we multiply these two together to get the posterior probability of x, the sentence in the target language, given the probability uh, uh, given the sentence in the source language. Now, modern machine translation systems don't work like this. They are not. This is a example of a generative model where we using a we are using a generative model um, to infer a discriminative. Um, decision rule. In modern machine translation systems, the probability of x given y is directly modeled. So we're directly modeling this distribution by conditioning on the source sentence and modeling a distribution for the output sentence. And we're going to look at some examples of these type of models in the last units. Okay. So how are language models trained? So far we have considered just generic distributions, but now to make it more precise, we now use P model of X given parameters W to distinguish the model in particular from the data distribution and to indicate that the model has some parameters W that we wanna train. Like think of this as a neural network or some other type of model Mm, we're going to look at uh, probability tables in the second unit, for example. Um, so this is a model that has some parameters. So we're going to use this expression from now on. So let X denote a training set of sentences X I. So this is one sentence and we have T I because the sentences might have different length and calligraphic X is the set of all uh, sentences in the training set. We can then train an unconditional language model. So this is an unconditional model, right? We're modeling an unconditional distribution over X um, via maximum likelihood. This is a standard formulation that we've seen before where um, the prediction, the maximum likelihood prediction is the argmax over the parameters of um, the product of the model distribution for the entire data set, i equals one to n. This is the size of the data set. Right. So this is the same. Now, if we, this is the same as this expression. If we apply the logarithm to it, the logarithm is a monotonic function. Um, so we can pull this through this product. So the product turns into sum. So we have argmax of w. Um, of i equals one to n, a logarithm of p model xi given the parameters. So we see that, um, now, now we just added a minus and minimized instead of maximized. We see that this corresponds to a minimization problem of the cross entropy. We have the cross entropy here. It's the expectation of the uh, data um, uh, of log uh, p model 
with respect to the data distribution. Right, so here we have the data points that we plug in here. We have this expectation of um, log p model of x with respect to the data distribution. There shouldn't be an index i here. This should be just x. So we minimize the cross entropy between the data and the model distribution. That's intuitive. If we minimize that, then the model is as similar as possible to the data distribution. And that's what we want. That's what training is. Okay. Um, now let's talk about evaluation. We of course want to measure the performance of such a trained language model. And character language models are typically measure performance in bits per character. In order to do that, we first need to introduce some basic quantities from information theory. Um, the first is the Shannon information. Given a character sequence x of length t with probability p of x, the so-called surprise or Shannon information Normalized by the sequence length t is the normalized negative log likelihood of x. This is called the Shannon information or the surprise. So we have minus 1 over t. This is a normalizing constant to normalize with respect to the sequence length, to get independent of the sequence length. And then we simply have the logarithm, the basis of 2 of p of x. And because um, p of x can be decomposed into this sequence of conditionals, we have the sum t from 1 to t, the sequence length of log 2 of p of x t given all the previous x's. And we measure this, the unit of for this is bits because we are using the basis 2 for the logarithm here. So, and we see, we'll see in a second why um, it makes sense to measure this in bits. Intuitively, if consider a distribution over x, if we observe an x and the probability for that x is low under that distribution that we have, then the negative logarithm of that expression is large. So the surprise is large. Surprise or the information when observing something that's unlikely under our distribution is large. Or conversely, if we observe something that has a high probability of occurring, the information or the surprise is low. We're not surprised to see that because it's likely under our model anyway. That's how you can think about the Shen information. Now the Expected surprise of the model under the data distribution for sequences of length t is therefore given by the normalized cross entropy. What we did here is simply take this expression and take the expectation over the data distribution. We average over the entire data set, in other words. And this is the expected surprise that we have given our trained model p model. Right. Okay. And a, um, a, a model is better, of course, if the expected surprise is low. If the model models the data distribution well, the expected surprise is low. And better models have a smaller number of bits. Now, we can take this one step further. If we consider sequences of arbitrary length by taking the limit, the limit of t to infinity. By the shannon macmillan brayman theorem, the cross entropy simplifies in this case. So here we have the expression from before, the cross entropy of the uh, model distribution with respect to the data distribution. And we can approximate that by 
um, the expression inside the expectation. As each sequence, each sequence x, over which we calculate this expectation, occurs in proportion to its probability anyways, if we consider long enough sequences. So think of an infinite text x that is generated from some data distribution. And because this model distribution factorizes into this expression where a, you know, into these conditional probabilities where a word depends on all the previous words. So you can think of this as a large, with the logarithm as a large sum. So we have the sum over the entire data set of, let's say, sentences. And then we have a sum over each sentence. Now, if we let this, uh, the sequence length or the sentence length go to infinity, then the expectation um, doesn't matter because we are, each sequence anyway occurs in proportion to its probability. Right? So each of these terms that are added together anyways occur anyways occur in proportion to um, their probability. And so for long sequence lengths, this is a, a reasonable approximation to make. And that's um, what, what people typically compute in practice when they report cross entropy in bits, which is the measure for uh, character level language models and lower is better. Now, uh, one little remark in practice, of course, this cross entropy H is evaluated on a test or validation sequence X. We're not evaluating on the training sequence because that might just measure overfitting. But we're measuring generalization performance by evaluating on a test or validation sequence X. That's a um, sequence or a data set, a very long sequence that's not part of the training set. So here's an example. So we're, we're making now an example for or several examples for this expression here to get an intuition of what, what these numbers will look like. So remember this expression, minus one over T log two of P model of X. So in the first example, we consider a vocabulary V with two symbols a and b and the sequences of length 10. Now assume that this probability distribution, the data distribution over sequences of length t factorizes completely into each the probability of each individual token in a sequence. In other words, in the simple example, the probability of the next word is completely independent of the previous words. It's a very simple distribution. It's fully factorized, but it serves the purpose of this illustration here. And let's further assume that the probability of each of these symbols occurring in that sequence at each location in that sequence is one half. So with 50%, we observe A, with 50% we observe B, and then for the next character, with 50% we observe A, and 50% we observe B. And let's assume that this is the case for both the data and the model distribution. In that case, the cross entropy is um, minus one over 10, this is the sequence length normalizer, log two of one half, because each of these occur with probability one half, to the power of 10, because we have a sequence length of 10. So this model is simply factorizing here like, uh, like this. So we have product over one half. We have this, pro we have 10 of these products here. So we have one half over 10. Now we can bring uh, this normalizer here to the exponent. So we have 10 divided by 10 and uh, we have a minus, so one half turns upside down. So we have log two of two, which is one bit. So in this case, the amount of information needed to predict the next character is one bit in the simple 
we call it a unigram model because um, for uh, the next word, the next word does not depend on the previous words. It's called a unigram model. We'll see this in the next unit. And it, um, the amount of information needed to predict the next character is one bit, <clears throat> as the next character is either A or B with equal probability. And the previous word doesn't tell us anything about the next word. Now, we can already see why this measure of one bit that Shannon proposed in his famous paper in 48 makes sense. Because one bit is the best encoding possible if you would want to code this language into a bit stream. This is the best encoding that you can find to transmit this language from a sender to a receiver party. There's no better encoding. Each character can occur with probability one half. You need to spend one bit per character. There's no better compression that you can come up with. Um, as a more general remark, a uniform distribution as we have it here, 50-50, always maximizes the entropy. And, and therefore this is a upper bound for a vocabulary of respective size. So one bit is an upper bound in terms of the information that we need to transmit if our voc vocabulary has size two. Let's consider a second example. Again, we have a vocabulary of two elements A and B and sequences of length 10. And again, we assume that we have such a unigram model where the distribution over the characters completely factorizes into the individual distribution of each character. But now, in contrast to before, we assume the probability of seeing A is 1 and the probability of seeing B is 0. And let's assume this is true for both the data and the model distribution. Now in this case, um, the cross entropy is uh, 1 over 10, the normalizer log 2 and then 1 to the power of 10, because we have probability 1 for A, and with probability 1 we also observe A, so we have 10 times 1, so 1 to the power of 10, which is um, the logarithm of uh, 1, which is 0 bits. And this is intuitive. In this case, the amount of information needed to predict the next character is 0 bits, as the next character is always A. In other words, we don't need any capacity to transmit this language through some channel as it contains no information. The receiver, it would be sufficient for the receiver to know that it always expects A. If the receiver knows that it always expects A, nothing has to be transmitted. It's always receiving A. And uh, the same remark as before here, we have the lower bound. Zero bits is the minimal value for the entropy or cross entropy. It's a lower bound, but this is of course a bound that for realistic distributions will not be, or for realistic applications will not be achieved because um, this would be a, a language or a problem that doesn't make sense to always transmit just the same character. This is a third example. In this case, we consider vocabulary of two tokens, A and B again, with uh, sequences of length. 10, so the same setup, completely factorized, but now we have the probability of A being 0 0.1 and the probability of B being 0 0.9. And again, we have this for both the model and the data distribution. So in this case, the cross entropy on average is uh, 1 over 10 log 2. And then in this case, we observe one time uh, A so we have 1 over 10 to the power of 1. And, and 9 times in this case here, um, this is on average, right? So, But let's assume we have a, a concrete sequence where we observe A and then 9 Bs. So we have 1 over 10 to the power of 1 and uh, 9 over 10 to the power of 9 because we observe B 9 times in this concrete test sequence. Now this is 0 0.47 bits. 
We need 0 0.497 bits as we sometimes observe A but most often observe B. Therefore the information conveyed in this language model must be larger than 0 bits. This is the extreme case where we always observe one character. And smaller than 1 bit which is the upper bound which is the case when we observe each character with equal probability. And here's a fourth example. In this case, again, we have the two character vocabulary and sequences of length t and fully factorized distributions. And also the probability for a being 0 0.1 and b 0 0.9 as before, but in this case only for the model distribution. But we assume now that for the data distribution, the probability of observing A is one and the probability of observing B is zero. In this case, the cross entropy is one over 10 log two. And now we have one over 10, right? Um, uh, to the power of 10, because um, in the data, we always, in, in the data set, in the test set, we always observe A, but under the model, A has only probability 0.1. We can already see this discrepancy. The model is not a good fit um, to the data distribution. In this case, we have log two of 10, which is 3.32 3 bits. And we can see that in this case, um, where the uh, model and the data distributions are not the same, one bit is not the upper bound. We need more than one bit now as the model fits the data badly. And we can decompose these 3.32 bits into two numbers. The first is 0 0.47 bits, which are required to encode any possible outcome of P data using the code optimized for P data. This is the situation that we had before. This is the case where the model and the data distributions are the same, and we need 0 0.47 bits um, in this optimal case. But then we need additionally 2.85 bits to encode any possible outcome of p data using the code optimized for p model, where the model in this extreme case here that we've chosen for this example is actually um, a bad model for that data distribution. In other words, um, and this is an uh, equation that's uh, universally correct, the cross entropy uh, of the um, model distribution with respect to the data distribution is the entropy of the data distribution plus the KL divergence between the data and the model distribution. And because this KL divergence, this is this 2.85 bits, must always be bigger or equal than one, uh, bigger or equal to zero, we know that the entropy of P data is a lower bound on the cross entropy of P model with respect to P data. So the cross entropy that we obtain, because our model is always imperfect, must always be bigger or equal to the entropy of the data distribution. So the, in other words, the entropy of the data distribution is a lower bound to the cross entropy that we compute in practice. This was for character language models. Now we move to word language models. It would be natural to measure word language models in bits per word. We have measured character language models in bits per character, so it would be natural to measure word language models in bits per word. However, word language models are traditionally measured in perplexity which is a measure that's very related to bits per word to the cross entropy. Um, and it's related in the way that perplexity is two to the power of the cross entropy. Right. So this is the way people typically, traditional, uh, typically measure the performance of word language models. Two to the power of h is uh, this expression here. Right assuming uh, t is large. And uh, this expression can be further simplified to p model of x to the power of minus one over t. And then if we uh, consider this uh, p model distribution in terms of its conditional distributions, we get this expression here. 
So the perplexity can be interpreted as the inverse probability of the test set normalized by the sequence length. So again, we have this normalization factor here, which acts uh, as a geometric mean. And again, of course, this perplexity measure, this metric is evaluated on a test or validation sequence, not on the training sequence. So let's look at some examples. In this case, we consider a vocabulary with three elements, A, B, and C, and sequences of length 10. And again, we assume unigrams, so the fully factorized case, where we have a probability of one third for each of the elements in the vocabulary. In this case, for both the data and the model distribution. So let's now compute this expression here. We have one third to the power of 10 and then to the power of minus one over the sequence length. So uh, these two cancel here, so we get three. And we can already see that this has some intuitive interpretation, which is probably also the reason why this is such a popular measure for evaluating word level language models. Namely, we see that the perplexity models the number of possible next tokens to choose from. In this case, the model is maximally confused which of the three tokens A, B or C to pick because they all occur independently with equal probability. If probably one, probability one third, um, we should pick A. With probability one third, we should pick B. And with probability one third, we should pick C. So the model is maximally confused. Um, and each of the three is equally likely. And therefore perplexity is often also called the average branching factor because we have a free branching opportunities here that are all equally likely. So the model has a average branching factor of three. The same remark as before, a uniform distribution, as is the case in this example, maximizes the perplexity. So it serves as an upper bound for the um, um, perplexity in the case that the, the model and the data distribution are the same. Now consider the same vocabulary, the same sequence length, the same factorization, but now let's assume the probability for A is one and the probability for B and C is zero. Again, for both the data and the model distribution. In this case, the perplexity is one to the power of 10 because we're always picking one in each of these 10, for each of these 10 words, A, B, and C in this case are words, but I, I used A, B, and C for simplicity, but think of words. So we have probability one for word A, we have that 10 times to the power of minus one over 10, which is one. And so we see that the perplexity reduces in this case as the next choice is certain. The average branching factor is one. We know we have to choose A. The model is not surprised, in other words, to see the test set as it is able to break the test set exactly. It's all A's. And the same remark, one is the minimum value for the perplexity measure, so it's a lower bound. And however, this is only achievable for languages that contain only a single token R that are always, where each token is the same in that language, which of course is not very useful in practice, but it's a lower bound. Now in the third example, consider the same vocabulary, same sequence length, same decomposition. Um, but now let's assume that the probability for A is 0 0.1, the probability for B is 0 0.9 and probability for C is zero. And assume this for both the data and the model. In this case, the perplexity is one over 10 to the power of one on average. We observe one times um, A and nine times B. And if we calculate this for this particular test sentence where we have one times we have A and nine times we have B, we get a perplexity of 1.38, which is slightly larger than one as the model is quite certain that it should predict B, but sometimes it should predict A. So it's not, not just one, it's, it's slightly more than one. 
but it's, it's lower than free because the model and data distribution in this case are the same. And uh, so free is the upper bound. And now let's consider the case in the fourth example where the model and the data distribution are actually different. So we have the case from before with P of A 0 0.1, P of B 0 0.9, P of C 0 for the model distribution. But let's assume um, the test sentence is just A's. With probability one, we observe A, which means that we have one over 10, the probability for A, the, the model, 10 times, we observe 10 A's, and this is uh, yields a perplexity of 10. So now the, the average branching factor is even larger than the number of symbols in the vocabulary because we're having a very bad fit of our model for that particular data distribution. Okay. Some concluding remarks for the evaluation of language models. So Shannon already in, in 48, with the primitive tools that were available at the time, estimated that English text has approximately 0 0.6 to 1.3 bits per character. And it turns out that his predictions at the time are actually quite accurate. For current language models, the current performance is roughly one bit per character. However, for word language models, the perplexities of around 60 were typical until 2017. How do these two relate? Well, according to Quora, there are on average 4.79 letters per word, excluding spaces. So if we include spaces and assume one bit per character for a language model, we have a perplexity of two to the power of 5.79, which is 55.3. That is roughly aligned with this 60 here. So you can see that character and lang uh, word language models at that time were roughly comparable. But state-of-the-art models, as they have appeared over the last two to three years, like GPT-2, GPT-3, Megatron, LM, yield perplexities of 10 to 20. How is that possible? <laughs> um, well, <clears throat> Um, absolute numbers are diffi difficult to compare for language models. In particular, metrics are very difficult to compare across vocabularies or data sets. It's not um, the same to uh, truncate the vocabulary, as is often done in these cases, to maybe the 10,000 most frequent words and compute the perplexities over those truncated vocabularies compared to computing perplexities over the entire um, vocabulary of all of English in the world. And also these data sets or these models are applied to data sets that in many cases are very specific. They're still general, but they are not as general as general language. That could be a technical textbook or Shakespeare or anything else. And so it's, it's, we need to be careful when we compare perplexities and we need to always consider the same vocabulary and the same data set. Finally, um, I want to point you to, to additional resources on the web. If you're interested in, in more details about language models, I can recommend these two links.